Alrighty. Hello everybody. This is Jonathan, Game Master J, and welcome to Nikos RPG, the Game Master Soapbox. If you've been on watch our show before, you know the format, and if you don't, I will be explaining to you really shortly. If you are a first time visitor, make sure you click the uh, subscribe button so you'll be able to catch all the information when we come up with it. Make sure you uh, click the notification bell so you know when every new video comes out. Alrighty, so we are going to be covering six topics as we usually do. And I will be covering each one for about 10 minutes or so. And so the first one right off the bat, we're going to start with the three reasons to play role play games. Why I particularly am a game master, and why you may have, maybe I should have said why I, why should you be a game master? Then the key skills that you can learn from playing role playing games, world building do's and don'ts. My rant today is titled "What's my motivation?" If you've done any game mastering, if you talk to anybody who's been a storyteller or game master, you know exactly what I'm talking about there. And then finally, I want to talk about how you can get a free copy of the Nikos RPG System Book PDF this weekend. So, alrighty, so we're going to start right off with the three reasons to play role-playing games. Well, there's actually as many reasons to play a role-playing game as there are people that play them. So, I'm not going to bore you and we're not going to waste any time. We'll go directly to them. And these are the three primary reasons you should be playing role play games. So the first one is social interaction. Our culture and our society is such that most of the time interaction between individuals and other individuals comes down to either their work or their passion or their um, real life or their family life. And role playing games allow you to interact in that kind of family direction, family connection level. And it, it is for those who are, if you will, professionals, and it's also for those that are casuals. But the real point is that the interaction with people, with other individuals, is critical. And role-playing is nothing if it isn't direct communication. So the first reason, therefore, is to connect with people. The second reason you want to play role-playing games is that there is this portion of our existence that we... We leave behind when we go from being in, uh, children to being adults, and that is we leave behind our imagination. And again, the concept of role-playing games requires delving into that part of our development and our personality that can get lost in the shuffle, so to speak, and quite often is crushed by imitation rather than innovation and we want to definitely try to stay on the creative side and so by creating a role-playing space in your head and you are engaging at that level what you're actually doing is you are transporting yourself now unfortunately i can't say you can transport yourself from you know, new york to chicago overnight but you certainly can put yourself in that place in your mind and therefore in a role-playing game you are putting yourself in a position of being in another place at another time. Uh, this, this could be as simple as a different location, but it can also be a different time in a different environment in a different culture and on and on and on. But this imaginative aspect of playing role-playing games is critical to being able to stimulate our own creativity in other ways. The the idea of riding a bicycle comes to mind. We certainly all, uh, those of us that have learned how to ride a bicycle, learned it, and it literally was, we didn't know how to do it, we didn't know how to do it, we practiced, we figured out the muscles, muscle triggers, and all of a sudden we got it, we understood it, we accepted it, and we were able to do it. In the same fashion, if you are looking at your life and you're saying, well, I don't feel like I'm very creative or imaginative, Get yourself into an environment where you are being imaginative at some level. And what it does is it spawns more creativity, more expansion, more wonderment and awakeness, if you will. And so that's the second reason is to develop your imagination. The third uh, reason to play role-playing games is that it creates the connections within your brain with people so that you're sharing that experience. 
many times people have a great idea and they try to have a difficulty figuring out how to articulate it. In a role-playing game environment, the storyteller's job, the game master's job, is to create that environment for you, but it then demands your interaction so that he knows that the message that got to you is exactly what he was intending to say. And so it's really important to make sure that you are getting involved with the role play because it lets you learn how to weave those two pieces I talked about before together. And more importantly, you can start to expand that uh, nature. So going back over it really quickly, I actually had a little bit of time. I, I got a little excited and got going on it really quickly. So the three three reasons to role play role playing games is connect. You've got to be it's a play play environment. You are enjoying the experience of being with other people, whether it be at a tabletop, which is my preference, or an online environment, which is my preference. Uh, there's a funny story there, but the the reality is is that when you are involved with role playing games, you are involved with people, and that is critical to developing social skills, communications capabilities, awareness of your environment, awareness of other people, and being able to be in that. And second, being you want to develop your imagination and your creativity and your ability to see things that are not physically yet in evidence. And the this, this creativity spawns other creativity. And beyond those two, it's the ability to communicate, to connect, to be part of a whole. And that's really important. You want to make sure that you've got all three of those aspects in life and role-playing is the way to get to there. All right. Why am I a game master? Well, you're asking me, I'm asking you, why are you a game master? And if that question were posed to, posed to me, I would say, well, first of all, I'm a game master because I love doing it. It's just something I, I've always enjoyed doing. And I put it, I would posit it back to you. If you love to play if you love to be playful and enjoy the company of others role playing and being a game master is a great way to do that because that gives you that uh connection that that linkage that we all desire and crave and we all have the uh desire or the wish that we were somehow uh we were somehow more uh commanding more instructional better teachers, better speakers, better presenters, better at being people. And and games mastery is a great way to do that. And so, yes, I, I from just a pure tangible way, I, I want to be able to do that. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm a game master. A secondary reason is I have a story to tell. Everybody does. Every, they, they, there's a, a great writers often will say, and I'm a, a, as a writer, I wouldn't say I'm a great one, but, uh, as a, a writer, I can tell you that one of the most important things to realize is that every single human being on the planet has at least one good story to tell. And maybe it's not your story. Maybe it's a story that you heard someplace that you want to be able to re relate and repeat. Maybe it's an experiential thing where you've had an experience in your life that you want others to share in and you don't know how to convey that information. By becoming a game master, you're able to create the framework where the story that you tell becomes the backdrop for everybody else's imaginative place. Those people that are the players, they become your audience, but they also, in a way, become the sounding box where if you have a piece of the story that you start to tell and it doesn't seem to go well, you know that you've got to expand the way you talk. You've got to give more to the table than you did before. Uh, a third reason that you would want to be a game master, why I want to be a game master, is I like the idea of being a director, I, I, I would, you know, there are people who do this in movies and have the, the gift and the skill and the talent to create visual imagery that is just so compelling that it brings people into it. And in my case, I've, I, I'm developing and have over the last 50 years, 47, I know, 45, whatever you want to use, 40, I, I, that's a story for a previous episode. And you can also uh, ask me about it at some other point, but the idea of doing it for 50 years, you tend to build those skills. And it's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful to be able to connect with other people and have them see what you see, that you give the description and they get it. They respond 
with their actions based on the narrative you've provided. And so now, not only are you engaged in that, but you, it's now a shared experience. And so as a game master, it's the ability to connect to an audience, a very, perhaps a very focused one, but it can, you know, it can be expansive. And ultimately, it's being a performer, you know, as a, as a game master, you're not only a storyteller, not only a narrative, you're not just a narrator, you're actually now getting the chance to be the individuals that you have as the non-player cast. The number of people that you become in game expands your ability to be perhaps empathic because now you're starting to think and feel what that person in that role would be seeing, feeling. The, it, it enhances your communication from a standpoint of vernacular. If I'm presenting myself as a pirate, I have to use parlance for the pirate role. I've got to become, for my players, that personality, that pirate in that case. And when you do that, when you take on that particular role, you're able to increase your ability to be empathic, to share what you're feeling so that others will feel it as well. And this is really important to expansion and the, the excitement level in your life is going to be tied directly to how enthusiastic you can be about the story you're telling. And the bigger and the broader and more expansive the story is that you tell, the more you have tendrils of yourself emanating out into the player base and the persons that are sitting at your table will eat it up and they will feed back on it and that creates that syncopation that, that synchronicity of thought that makes the really enjoyable role play experiences absolutely intoxicating uh now when I talk about becoming a game master or why I became one there's also the issue of learning a skill and when I started, I wasn't thinking about building it as a skill. I was 11 years old, and I what I wanted was I wanted to have a circle of people that would be my friends. I moved a lot. I've mentioned this before. I moved 40 times before I was 18. I went to 22 different grade schools, six different high schools across 11 different states. And in being in all those different places and always being the new kid on the block, it's tough to build a circle of friends. And being a game master is a way to have a qualified number of people that want to be where you are, want to hear what you have to say, and want to interact with it. And that connection becomes uh, essentially part of who you are to the point where when you are a really good game master, it also means that you tend to be a pretty good presenter, a pretty good sales folk, if you will, a great demonstrator, in other words, you can negotiate or you can become better at everything that you are doing when you were only doing it because initially because it was a lot of fun. Now you're doing it because it actually has an impact and you're bringing the players into your environment and you're connecting and you're being, being able to then build those skills. Additionally, one of the reasons to become a game master is because the um, there is a charge, there is an excitement about being an adjudicator, a person who makes decisions, who uh, picks a direction. And while there will be discussion on what, what that means in terms of are you a, a storyteller, are you a... Um, are you, are you in the role as a railroad conductor? Are you driving them through, on a bus through your story? Or are you a sandbox kind of a person standing back as a uh, arbiter of justice, so to speak? Any of those kind of things, the aspect of being a game master is that you get to pick how that is presented and portrayed and received. And ultimately, the, the reason to become a game master is that if you have a story to tell, and you haven't figured out how to tell it by having a listening audience that's going to respond with you. You will be able to get better handles on how to tell the story, what parts of the story that you have to say are what people want to hear and how much of it is just you uh, pontificating. You know, if, if you are a writer and I have been, I've written 350 books or so in the last six years as a ghostwriter. When you write books and you create inf information for people, that's often a one-way track. 
instead of a two-way track. And role-playing is a real way to viscerally get back response on that was cool, that was stupid, you're, you're, doing, you're, you're making it enjoyable, you're making it painful. You're learning all these things about yourself as you go. So these are the reasons why I am a game master. I think that the the biggest, if I was going to say of all those things, what one is most important to me is that I want there to be an affirmation of valuation. In other words, if I tell a story and I've got one person that 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 listens to it, that's that's great. If I tell if I write a a, a piece of fiction for a uh, another author, if I write an a, an art, a, a book for someone else and I present it to them and they like it, that's great. That's one person. But the trick is, is that, of course, if that book is presented to a lot of people, you hope that there'll be more that would want to buy into it, you know, get involved in that storyline, want to know more about the characters that you're creating. And by doing it in a live setting with players that are interacting immediately, Games Mastery is a great way to start to build those kind of skills that doesn't mean everything you do gets written down, but quite often the things that you write uh, that you come up with in story become parts and elements that the player wants to interact with or wants to follow. So, all righty. So now we're going to talk about the key skill key skills you can learn from playing role playing games. Okay, most of us know how to talk. That's an obvious thing that we are all granted with, and many of us talk more than we listen, and that's that's both a kind of a positive and a negative, but the, the reality is that one of the key skills that you can develop from playing role-play games is to gather information. One One way, of course, that we gather information is by hearing somebody say something, and that's that's one marvelous way to to learn but that doesn't necessarily help us in the outcome output we're not necessarily learning to be a good presenter good speaker we, we're not necessarily learning what we have to do to make sure the information that we give out is responded to but in role-playing games especially if you're a game master and it can be as a player as well learning how to express yourself becomes paramount you have to be able to communicate to have fun in a role play game you have to be able to give and take and one of the key skills you can learn is to speak properly and that by that i mean make sense of the words that come out of your mouth so that the other person can take that information in process it and then respond to it appropriately this skill in the communication, it comes from more than just the ability to speak. You become a much better listener when you're playing a role-playing game. In other words, not only listen to the words that the storyteller, the game master is saying, or the players are reacting to, but more important than just what they're, what they're saying, but how they're saying it. What emotion are you gleaning from the interaction? If it's supposed to be a scary situation and players are laughing at you or laughing with you you've missed your target you're not actually getting through so you have to learn from that and the only way you can learn from that is if you're listening one of the great secrets and i'm not even gonna put this on the list but one of the great secrets to being a uh, a player of role-playing games one of the biggest things is to be far, far far more of a listener than you are a speaker my grandfather used to always say, you've got two ears and one mouth. So if you're going to be talking and you spend most of your time talking, you're not being nearly as effective a communicator as you are when you listen twice as much as you speak. Now, from that, you get the, also the ability to uh, take notes. The role-playing games in general are... For the most part, they are a series of dice roll combat actions and a series of simple to complex puzzles that need to be solved. And some of them are moving moving parts puzzles like uh, a conflict between two countries or the conflict between a store owner and someone in the store. These all are things that require great listening skills 
and great communication skills because if you're going to be fulfilling a role in culture or in our society, you have to be able to not only hear what the opponent has said or the, the proponent has said, and you're feedbacking off of what their response is to what you said, but now there's a, a third nuance, and that is that sometimes there is information being conveyed that doesn't have to do with you or them. The third party, the person who is watching from on high, the person that is uh, outside of the environment, can be interacting with you while you are doing it. Now, when I started doing live uh, role play sessions on uh, YouTube, I did several years uh, through Twitch of long form shows, and you can see several dozens of those on the Nikos RPG channel. If you look, uh, there's a playlist of the old adventures that I used to run. And what you'll notice about them is that there are a group of people that are very disparate. They're very widely varied. I've got uh, young uh, youngsters that are 78 years old, and I've got uh, veteran players that are 16. So it, it and I, I said it that way on purpose. There is a uh, there is a skill in being able to bridge communications barriers, one of which is age, another of which is culture, a third of which is gender. These are all things that have to be overcome in order to enjoy a role-playing game. You have to be able to get past the parts that, that are blockages to you that might be clear to someone else, and you also have to be able to portray what you're getting from it so that the other participants can also gather and grok that that information so a third a third key skill is the ability to translate and to take notes if you are not a prolific note taker if you don't scratch down a lot of notes learn at least to write down the names learn to write down the places write down the descriptions perhaps if they're more helpful to you the point is is that the role-playing character in whatever he is, whatever, whether he or she is, whether it be a primary character or if it's a uh, sideline helper character or if it's a uh, hole in the wall, I'm not sure what I'm doing kind of a character. All of these, when properly portrayed, bring to the table a fascination and a wonderment about the property itself. And therefore, you can learn skills in negotiation. You can learn skills in barter and trade. You can learn uh, presentation skills. Other, other key skills you can learn from playing role-playing games is mathematics. I know that sometimes a, a challenge many people, and I'm one of them, for years was told I couldn't have a calculator at my desk when I was in class, and no one would have any need for uh calculus during their life or whatever and yet I have found many of the conversations that I have in game spawn quick mathematic calculations uh, analysis of a formula and things like that simply by the narrative it's not necessarily the difficulties of a playing system although those are there as well but they can simply be a quick quick subtraction you've had 97 hit points and i've hit you for 12 points of damage how many hit points do you have left so when you have to you know when you figure that out you go okay well i'm still at about uh about 80 percent of my my original hit points that, that i can take a few more hits like that and then continue the interaction but the the quickness of the use i mean the the preeminence of math is not as important as it is context, understanding what what the mechanism of that agreement arrangement is, and therefore being able to hold those mathematical concepts in your head. And uh, another thing you can learn from playing role play games is that uh, very rarely are things absolutely even Stephen fair. The idea that any given uh, uh, action is literally a flip of a coin is patently ludicrous when we do when we are involved in a role-playing game especially when we are playing a character within a group our opinion is only one voice out of however many are there but the strength of our argument the strength of our position based on what we've got for notes and what we've done as far as math calculations becomes so much more than that and it literally can change the course 
of the destiny of that adventure world. Alrighty, which brings me to adventure worlds and the idea of world building. The first, very first thing you need to know about world building do's and don'ts is that you don't have to do it. If you are a game master and you are starting to develop the idea, will, and the desire to be a game master, you don't have to be a world builder. That sounds counterintuitive because everyone talks about their budding campaign that they are building and such. And while it is true you can begin world building, but the reality is that human interaction, even just the one-on-one -on -one kind of things that we're doing in this conversation, this is one-sided. I'm presenting and I'm not, you know, feeding back directly on anything that anybody is particularly saying to me. But the conversation of a role play game doesn't need to have an understanding of ooh, how many hours there are in a day or whether the sky is pink or blue. It doesn't have to have an understanding of ancient history, modern history, or uh, differences in culture. It simply is the realism of the connection between individuals within the framework. Now, granted, the frameworks all have their own scaffolding called the game mechanics. And the scaffolding generally has to be something that's shared with the other players, and usually it's defined by whatever game system you're playing in. But the need to do world building isn't there. There's no need to begin with that. So that's the first uh, realization, is that you don't have to world build. However, if you are going to build a world, and this is perhaps critical from the longer scale, if you are a storyteller, you're picking up a game to play, and you're going to you know, open the book and become a game master on the spot, you didn't have to do any world building because there's a narrative generally in any game that you find. But even without that, you don't necessarily have to have the world building mechanism. But if you start to go that direction, realize the first things you have to build are the things literally in the backyard of the players. What that really comes down to is your story has to start small. So rule one of world building, if you're going to have a world building mechanism, first thing is to start small. Don't, don't try to take on the global expanse, the expenditures. I remember the first module or first adventure that I ran out of, uh, written documentation, which, of course, I immediately appropriated into the Nikos lore and such. But that first mechanism was a village. And that little village was like seven buildings in size. And it did have some tiny amount of lore tied into the families that lived there before or whatever. But that wasn't even what was necessary. The part of the world building that came from starting small is you have to have a clear picture in your mind of what the characters are going to see. Description for a game master really needs to be who, what, when, where, wh and sometimes the why, and sometimes the how. But the, the basic same things that go into creating any literature or any, uh, any writings at all, even a journalist uses the same mechanism, you have to present the information so that it, so the people hearing it are seeing it. And so the key to that world building, therefore, is by staying small, you limit the amount of creativity you're demanding of your players. As you go along and as your story becomes more expansive and there's more things to discover and more things that might be fascinating to the players, they will naturally want to expand out into your world and connect with parts of it you haven't created yet. So that's the next next do on the list is do be aware and listen again to what your players are saying because from the players you can get a really solid feel for what they want out of the play experiences as well. And by having that when you're creating the new world, you are able to generate the kinds of content, the kind of adventures that the players are wanting to hear because those world building mechanisms require people to want to know them in my case going back quite a few years to the first iteration when i was like 16 years old i had a compulsion to 
always have a ready answer if the players came up with a question and inevitably that usually I mean generally that usually that generally means the players want to know about the location more than what you've taken and planned for so just realize that you don't limit yourself if they said uh you you said it's a town and there are roughly seven buildings and they go through and they ask you and you delineate there's this kind of a building and there's this kind of a shop and there's this kind of uh industry and there's this kind of you know dining place or whatever they're gonna go well that's four you need three more and so they're going to keep asking and when you fill out your seven that's when it gets fun because at that point the players are going to go yeah but you didn't include a name object that they would think of being in a village and suddenly you can go oh yeah across from the the place that i already described there's another one and then you have to take a note Also, you have to realize that world building isn't just what the game master does, but world building is what the players do when they interact with that world. If, for example, there is a law in a community that says there will be no street fighting, there will be no drawing of weapons on the main streets of town, inevitably one or more players are going to challenge that and they're going to pull a weapon or they're going to get involved in a conflict or they're going to start a fight. And you have to learn how to embrace that and decide what you're going to do with it as a world builder the mechanisms the actual game mechanics are second fiddle but what's of primary note is what you are doing with that story is it meant to be a hard and fast law that no one can break and if so how are you going to enforce it or conversely if it's not a hard and fast rule Maybe you know why it was started and where it came from, or you can imagine and create that information and create for yourself that portion of the backstory. So realize that the world building process is a, a, is, is a do. You're going to be saying yes and a lot. You're going to be building on what other people tell you. But you have to realize also that as the game master, as the world builder, you also have the ability to say don't. And so the world builder don'ts category is don't allow players to violate basic concepts that you put into the game without at least giving some interaction and response to their their pleas and their complaints. Uh, another part about world building that you need to think about is the visualization. I talked about the, the who, what, when, where, why, but you need to also have a clear understanding of relationships. You know, if the bar is down the street from the church, how does that work out? Does the, do the people from the church get upset with the people who are alcohol, you know, involved with alcohol and the party environment? Are, are there conflicts there? Is there an outreach? Is there a connection between them? These are all things that as a world builder, you have to start looking at not just the actual facts, but the expanded reality beyond the facts of the situation. If there is a bar and a church in the same little town, why do, why does, why do they both exist? What may have happened in the past that would put them in the position of being where they are? And this kind of thing. So realize that the element of creativity that is world building really stems to stems from your ability to clarify and isolate what each of those things means in your terms i was starting to uh, vary off of this story with them with the concept of me being a young game master when i finished first finished the arc and one of the things that i had done once i got to the conclusion of the arc was to realize i've got to find some way to make this a compelling story for others and so Yes, I took notes myself. I did some creativity. But you also have to do a lot of introspection, and that is get to know yourself better and get to know what that world means. If it is simply a list of place names, you could do that with a random name generator and some online tools, and you wouldn't have to do any mental gymnastics or work with it. But instead, if what you're doing is you have a story to tell, you have to figure out how to convey that story. Next is worry, don't worry about your world building in terms of chronology. 
don't think that the players have to have spent so many time periods at one location before they can know things. Certainly we pick up things all the time from a direct and indirect contact all the time. So feeling that you have to be restricted or limited to what you can or can't create is um, one of the don'ts. Don't, don't feel that limitation because you as the storyteller are the one that's creating that environment. Uh, world building will eventually deal with things like uh, uh, biospheres, you know, life cycles, what, what creatures are feeding on which creatures, what frequency do they feed, is the population going to sustain that, or is this a danger to the population, etc., etc., etc. But these are all layers of information that you can, you'll get to eventually. So again, start small, build from what you have in your head, and amplify with what the player's response is, and you'll be able to do some really great world building. Alrighty, I didn't get a good segue into this part, but now comes the rant. And as usual, I'm going to wait till the clock rolls over the top of the minute. And that way I keep myself on task because I tend to drift and meander. And the more I can stay on the point that I'm trying to get across, the better off it will be. Alrighty. When players sit down at your table and they provide you with their character sheet and background, the background was an element that was only added in the fifth iteration, fifth edition, I'm sorry, fifth edition. And by the way, you'll, by watching the channel, you figure out what the difference is between iteration and, and an uh, edition. But the phrase that I used to really have to grind over, and it isn't so bad with the, um, backstories is what is my motivation what is my character doing in this scene and this come this stems many times from those players who have an understanding of acting or they have played video games and they want to understand how their person their persona in the game is supposed to act what are their limitations what are they there for what is it they're gathering and this desire to know what the motivation is and what it is you're wanting to accomplish is greatly important. But when you have a player who takes this tone as if to say, you haven't given me enough to go on. You haven't given me what I was coming to get from the table. It really just chafes when they say, well, I'm not gonna do that thing because I don't understand my motivation and this need for motivation like i said to a to a, to a certain part certain level has been accommodated by background back background backstory possibility okay fishy lips to 420 i am here to, to help any game master dungeon master so uh you're more than welcome to to listen in here and so uh right now we're in world building i'm gonna be finishing that in just a minute uh so the motivation when you have when that question comes up what they're really saying is i don't understand where i fit in this story and this is where the game master gets his first opportunity to connect because by talking to the player and asking them questions, rather than having them ask you, what's motivation? You say, I, I'd love to know, I'd love to help you figure that out. So why don't you tell me something about the character? Tell me about your background, what your thought processes are, and get them to feed information to you. And when they do that feeding of information to you, then you can get a handle on what they are really looking for. because. That, remember that issue of always wanting belonging? The players want to belong to something. They want to be a part of the story. When you give the narrative portion, maybe they didn't hear. Maybe they didn't connect the dots between the character they built. And... All right, Fishy Lips, I will get to your question in just a second. I like that, that environment you're talking about. That's awesome. 
Uh, but the gathering of information and the connection. As a matter of fact, if you don't mind, fishy, fishy lips, I'm going to, going to use your question uh, in the same tone of what's my motivation. You are... Yeah, 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 I appreciate it. Um, an arcane punk, uh, arcane punk style world. There are... The first thing that you might want to do is consider looking for resources that convey the kind of world you want. There's a great movie that fits into what you're talking about called Abigail. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a foreign film, but it's uh, I think it's available on uh, Amazon Prime. And I think it's also available uh, through uh, Vudu, which is the site I use to get the movies that I watch a lot of the time. So put down on your viewing list the movie you're going to want to see would be Abigail. It's got that arcane punk slash steampunk. There's magic that's driving and conveying parts of the story in behind the scenes of a rather dark and cloudy environment where the conversations are sound cerebral, but maybe actually talking about stuff of magic and therefore doesn't have to be literally tied to the scientific concepts of our world. But the the... Therefore, the question about making a world, yes, so you do need to, you do need to put Abigail on your list, A-B-I-G-A-I-L. I believe it's Middle European, and I'm trying to remember, the, James, James Madsen, James Madsen is the primary character in that. Oh, no, he's not the primary character, but he is the father of the primary character and he's instrumental in the story so if you get a chance look up abigail as a resource for visualization so when you say you're looking for a world as i as i began with earlier in this episode let's look at it from the standpoint of what you're going to do on a small basis so think about instead of the entire world think about Whatever small town, what village, what if it's a if you're using a Dungeons and Dragons model, what is the dungeon? What is the place they're going to explore? If it's not that, if it's a more of a Cthulhu esque feel, then you need to have a description of the environment. You know, how many houses in the area? How many structures? Is there uh, are there pr people in power in that area that matter, or is it operated from outside externally? So. Uh, that's the first thing. And then um, a hook, the, the hook you're asking for has to be what is it you want them to explore, but you have to state it in a way so that they want to explore it. Um, like I've, I've, I've run games and in the preamble to the session or the campaign, I would say something along the lines of, well, I'm, I'm looking at doing a Scooby-Doo mystery just to use an example that isn't specifically yours. So I'm going to be doing a Scooby-Doo mystery. That means it's going to have action. It's going to have intrigue. It's going to have some silliness. It's going to have a talking dog, whatever, whatever things that are going to be interesting enough for the players to want to pursue it. So if you say, well, it's just like steampunk, only it's magical. That's partially a hook, but go one step further to say, yes, this adventure is placed in a place where the devices and the tools have magical aspects, magical properties. That way the players will start to create for themselves in their own minds what you are trying to convey and that gives them a reason to want to hook into the story that you're creating. So there's a, a myriad of ways this can be done. Uh, in the case of Abigail, you're observing a character who has none of the skills that have been described in the environment but she's related to somebody who is instrumental in the backstory. And so therefore she is a child of mystery. So following the life of a child of mystery in an environment where magic, it drives technology. That's a pretty compelling hook. So in your case, it might be, uh, oh, nice, nice. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So realize that there's a, there's, there's, there's a, I, what I call the dartboard principle. And the dartboard principle is, if you create a, a target, a, a dartboard target, and imagine that target being 
everybody who has ever played a role play game or might play a role play game that's a big big audience right but what you want are talking at, talking about targeting is what group of that large much larger piece is the group that you want to be the drivers in the story because if you create a magical environment but you bring in only martial characters if your players show up and they only want to play fighters that means you may not have hit your mark because you're not getting the inquisitive minds the mystical minds that you're looking for so you definitely want to you don't have to worry about certain groups when i talked about that bull board if you're going to throw a dart with any accuracy at all you're going to hit someplace on that board obviously you want to hit the sweet spot in the center because that gets exactly what you're wanting to get from the game which is continuity excitement and a desire to pursue the story but you want you want to leave it wide enough to let people know that yeah you can there, there's going to be stuff for the martial folks too. There's, there's going to be mystical items that apply to that or technology that's going to be playing into that. So, all right. So you've already got a, a, a series of characters going. All right. It sounds like you're on, you're already on your on your on your path for that. So now the question you asked was about plot. The plot actually has to be the black hole in the adventure, and that really. This is going to sound crazy. It has to be the part that you as a storyteller don't even know. I have seen uh, lots of interviews with different writers and almost to the man, they'll tell you that the book that they finished was never the book they started because you have an idea of what you want the story to be. Your players are going to have their ideas of what they want the story to be. And a good game master is going to draw from what the players want because he's listening to them. But he's also going to have a, 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 an overarching theme or plot that he wants to develop. And so the game revolves around the energy of those two groups feeding back on each other until you become an orbital system that's cohesive and stays together. So you want to be able to uh, I'm not following you, you changed it so many times. The, the, the point is that you, you want to Build what you want, then you build, you inter invite the players and hear what they want. The fact that you've got a cleric and you've got a druid and you've got an arcane trickster. Okay, you got the magic angle locked. Druid also, uh, druid says it's going to have something to do with the very nature of the world, and the cleric it means it's going to have something to do with some religious aspect of the world. And so those, those, um, elements bring uh, the players into the circle of the vacuum of what you want. So when you have, when you're concerning the motivation of your players, you're in effect right now asking the same question that I am asking, and that is, how do we get past the what's my motivation? How do we get past that? And the way we get past that motivation, the way we get back to our story is that we have to bring the players in over the top, so to speak, and hear what they're saying and then figure out how to bring the world up to meet them as much as you're bringing them down to it. Eat it. Therefore, the plot, really, the element of mystery really shouldn't be something that's pre-planned. Now, this is uh, one of the greatest advantages of utilizing a role-playing system like the Nikos RPG because it doesn't have those kind of... Uh, right, cool, cool. So in building the backstory, here's some things to think about when you're talking about that. When you're talking about building a backstory, if you make the backstory too complete, there's no real motivation for the player to actually be in the story. So make sure that you leave a lot of question marks. It should be something along the line of, you were raised in an orphanage. That begs the question, how did you get to be in an orphanage? Or you're, you're out in the wilderness and you're a, a hermit. How did you become a hermit? So you're out here working and guiding the players through the creation process, but you're doing it in such a way that you are linking what you have in mind with what they're doing. So, for example, in, in, the, in the former missive when we were talking about
Okay, so I'll answer that question the easiest way possible. When I started dealing with people who played clerics, I determined that the characters in a story at lowest level, when it, as most people run their campaigns as the hero's journey, therefore the players always start out at really ultra low power levels, realize that the gods, the powers that you have that are revolving around the world that are the defining pantheons that create the religions of the world, these organizations may be so highly developed that the player character is insignificant until they reach some threshold. So therefore, you don't have to build a lot of backstory as far as where they, where they went to seminary, what the, you know, what classes they favored, blah, 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 all the mundane stuff that goes into being a clergyman. Instead, you can go, I, you, you gather your power currently from the goodwill of the world, and therefore you are going to expand out and become more over time. And so therefore, we don't have to pursue all of that right now. Just realize you finished your schooling, you've come into this town, maybe it's a mission. You know, I, is the... Is their faith even uh, proselytizing? Do they, convert, do they convert people or not? There are plenty of people who are of a religious mind that are simply Stoics and keep it themselves and follow their own spiritual path and has nothing to do with evangelism or express, expounding the words of God or whatever. So you have to think about what they want. If he's a shaman and if the gods never reacted with them or interacted with them, that's perfectly natural because how many people in the world today want a personal walk with their their guy? They want they want that connection, and yet they don't experience that viscerally. Your your half work doesn't sound too far from any other person in terms of thinking that they they want to have the that relationship, but they haven't figured out how to do it yet. Uh thought that goals weren't real or that the gods weren't real and, were, and he was punished for it. It's what he wants. Well, okay. So if he wants deity, if you have, if you haven't seen the, the original Conan the Barbarian movie, put it on your list of films to watch. The Arnold Schwarzenegger earliest film. There is a great conversation between two individuals. Conan even has a belief in a god. He was advocated for by his parents into the belief that there's a god of steel. And he talks about Krom all the time and how Krom is the one to whom he reaches. But he also philosophically says, yeah, but God doesn't actually interact with us. We just eventually deserve to speak to God. So I'm on that kind of a path. So again, that's something you can do. Conversely, if you want to, to add mystery to it, you have in your, uh, your mind if there is a God, you know, if, if your adventuring environment, this mystical environment you're speaking of, this arcane punk universe, is there mystical powers from beyond? Are there real gods? Conversely, there's also the aspect of, for example, the Cthulhu mythos that says the gods are so powerful that we are so insignificant that they... they they don't even care about us. And so maybe that's the aspect that you want to portray. This is where you have to take your plot piece, what is it you're wanting them to discover, and tie it into the backstory. So if you're thinking plurality of gods, then yeah, maybe you need to do some pantheon work. That's, uh, that's I wouldn't. I would leave that to the players. Uh, in motion pictures, in a lot of movies, they use a methodology called putting a character in that's the Dorothy. It's a reference to the Wizard of Oz. And Dorothy, when she goes to Oz, is acting for, on behalf of us as the readers because she is in a place that we that she could, can't comprehend. And therefore, we also don't know what the difference is between a munchkin and a winky. We, we wouldn't know the difference. We, we have no idea what the Easter lands are and such like from... Uh, Frank Baum's story, except that we have Dorothy, who then has everything explained to her. And so maybe your priest is the Dorothy in the story, so that you can be absolutely shrouded in mystery for the gods, and then reveal to that player through the play, through the experience, through the things they see. Maybe it's from 
natural sight, so it ties into the druidic aspect. Maybe it's uh, actually he is the hands of God. Did the, did the gods perhaps touch the world and activate the powers? It's your it's your story, so I have no idea. So if if everything is so powerful that everything is like a god, maybe he's completely jaded. Maybe he wants to believe in the god that doesn't need powers. Maybe that's his aspect. You get to take the player down that path. You he, The person has conveyed to you what they would desire from the game, but there is no need for that to be absolutely what you do. And this is when I talked earlier about the the player desires and the game master's desires. If what you're trying to do as a story is to give a world that they can discover, then don't give him what he's asking for specifically. Give him the hooks. And the hooks would be, you want to know about the gods? There are many gods. As a matter of fact, within so many miles of your hometown, there are at least, and I'm putting a number, three, five, 19 temples. If you don't know which god there is to worship or which one you wish to pursue, maybe you don't know which one they're already talking to you, maybe you received a sign. These are all things that you can use as a game master to bring that person into the story you want to tell. So if the powerful beings are the equivalent of gods, if they're already connected in that way in your mind, then what makes the player anything but a pawn? And that's that's not a, a comfortable place that players want to be. They don't want to be felt like they're led around by their nose. So if they if they establish the gods, then you decide, is it one, three, five, nine? In, in, just to give a comparison, in, in my world, which is highly magical, the, uh, there are no actual, well, there are two gods in the world, but the two gods in the world are creations. They literally have been acknowledged as people who ascended to the power of the gods. And the reason and the way they got there was something that was played through in my previous iteration. But of course, without that, you have to come up with something. So yeah, whatever the ones that you choose, and you can choose one, none, or an infinite number, whatever number you want, then that then make the exploration of that entire list. You know, don't don't give him the here's the one you're following and just do this because then that's not role play in his part that's rote playing he's he's doing what you've told him and what he's memorized and that is ultimately dissatisfactory a player may choose to ask for rituals and stuff and you can give those to them even even in character but don't feel like that is anything other than a step towards what you're trying to accomplish. So my question to you in this case would be, what do you want the player to have? What do you want there to be for them? Do you want to create gods? Do you want to spend the time creating pantheons? If that's what you want to do, that's that's amazing because that, that is something that has to happen. Uh, world building generally starts with your local community and then goes to a national community. And then beyond that goes to the concept of theism, religion, and all of that. But if you want to pursue that and that's something that fascinates you, then go ahead and create them. There aren't there there are not gods he doesn't know. Okay. Then then you then feel free to build what they ask for, but I'm I, I, I am suggesting to you that your play experience as a game master will be more fulfilling for you and for them if there is some mystery in the process. Maybe it's that he has to go through certain tests and then your adventure levels, your adventure sequences can be the various steps of that ascension process to where he truly will know, truly will know God. And that's one way of doing it. Um, another one is maybe the, the gods of which you're speaking left behind artifacts that prove their existence and therefore he is supposed to be the future prophet of that specific deity for a coming age in the future and so he's supposed to collect those items that's another way to have done it um maybe he just simply builds to the point where he has enough power to make that ascension himself in the world of nikos for example and and, and this is uh okay 
So either his faith is a lie or that his faith is in something beyond what the world has. So maybe his faith will be enough to reinstate or establish two sides of a possible coin. That that God name that he believes in. Maybe he will manifest that being in his being by fulfilling the tasks or whatever you have in mind. But it doesn't have to be this developed. You're, you're overthinking what you need to bring the hook onto the player. So if he says, I want to play a cleric and I want to follow a god, say, great, here you go. And then chip away at that belief over time, letting him discover that the God he's been worshiping has been a false one. But that then begs the question, where did his power come from? If that person that was a God finds out that he's going to discredit him, that power is going to go away. At whatever point that happens, does the player manif still manifest clerical abilities? And if he does, where is that coming from? These are all meta. We're way past the concept phase. And so I'm, I, I think I might be over helping you. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you pointed that out. This is a mug I almost always remember to mention. I didn't yet. This mug was made for me by a very good friend of mine who was in my games group. He 3D printed it and he painted it and he didn't sign it, but his name is Day. And it's amazing. It's an amazing cup. And uh, I have access to them. So if you want some, I can get a hold of them and we can possibly uh, make them available to our members. But we are coming up to the end of what was my original show time. So I do want to uh, go into uh, how to get a free copy of the rules for the Dark Shirt system. So for the last three, four weeks, I've been struggling to put together the great Twitch RPG experiment. And has not has met with, with rather limited success. Oh, cool. Cool, cool. The, the way you, you would get involved with this is that Saturday morning at 10 a.m., I'm going to be running a game, and I'm using the template at startplaying.games. Make sure, I, I think I put that link earlier in my text. If you go up above, yeah. It's uh, startplaying.games slash adventure, blah, blah, blah. And that's that link will take you to the actual event. And it's a how to play Nikos RPG training session. And I'm going to be using it to catapult a weekly games event. Uh, there's no charge for the seminar portion. After that, there will be a, a stipulation that you're either a member of my Patreon at a certain dollar value, or you pay for the events that are being held. But they will always be on Saturdays at 10 in the morning. And so to get a free copy of the game, you all you have to do is simply show up for the Saturday session on this channel, 10 a.m. in the morning on Saturday, and join the Start Playing Dot Games event so I can get a hold of your email address and I will send you a free a link to the to get a free copy of the Dark Shard System Book. And the Dark Shard System Book is the mechanism that is it's set up to be a freestanding RPG, but it can act as a saddle. So you can utilize the information in it and uh, basically attach it to whatever mount you want, whether it be Dunge uh, Dungeons & Dragons 5e or if you're going to use Pathfinder or uh, Savage Worlds or whatever. The Nikos RPG Dark Shard system is the magic creation, the clerical creation, the, the faith and pantheons creation, and all of that. So that's going to be a possible uh, way of getting that. But um, a, a second methodology for getting that is to uh, subscribe to this channel because you'll get a ping when we start. And also remember to follow Nikos RPG so you get updates whenever we're running events on Twitch. And that will be a four hour session. Well, I'm setting up as a two-hour session, but it could go up to four hours on the, pre the creation process for characters in the game and how to actually utilize the system both as a player and as a game master. And it teaches, most importantly, the, the uh, quantum die rolling mechanism that I created that will change the way you look at dice forever. They completely shatters what you've 
had as far as expectation for what comes out of die rolling. So that's all coming up on Saturday. Uh, I want to thank you for being a part of this show for tonight. Uh, my my time is up for tonight. I anticipate only doing a couple, uh, couple uh, an hour or so once a night, and then my games events as well. So you can also get a hold of me by uh, going to pa uh, patreoncom nikos spelled the way it is on the sign up here, N Y C O S. So patreoncom nikos and you'll gather information from there. And if you become a subscriber, or, a, or if you become a, a patron of that, then you also gain access to my Discord, which means you can be on with me on voice chat. And whenever I do these presentations, you can be uh, part of the presentation in the show as well. So there also are other benefits. For example, the Patreon, uh, Patreon members that are at the $20 value, uh, level automatically become members of the Sunday Games Group. I actually run a game specifically for my Patreon supporters, Sundays af Sunday afternoons uh, between 2 and 6. And uh, just a quick men uh, mention back to, to my, uh, my uh, sponsor, Board Game Paradise, that logo in the corner. Board Game Paradise is in Redlands, California, and I run games live at the store two nights a week. Mondays is for my veteran players and Tuesday is for all new players. So if you've never played a role play game and you want to dive in with both elbows, you can definitely show up on Tuesday. We start at 6 p.m. both days, Monday and Tuesday, and we play through until the store closes at around 10 o'clock. So again, going over all of this, we've uh, talked about the reasons to play role play games. So if you didn't get a chance to hear that, make sure you watch this video it will be posted again beyond being on Twitch. It'll also be on YouTube here in a couple of hours. Uh, we've talked about why you, why you might want to be a game master and in particular why I am one. We talk about the key skills you can learn from role playing role playing games and how those can be practical live applications of what you've learned. We've talked a little bit about world building, which thanks to fishy lips, we've been able to have the conversation at a, at a, much more direct level and i hope that i've answered all the questions that you have fishy and if not you can certainly get a hold of the initial information by going to the patreon account patreon.com slash nikos or uh, you can also directly contact me i'm on facebook as jonathan g albin or as nikos rpg the youtube channel is also at nikos rpg so it's easy to find so if you have any questions or concerns i please put them either in the uh, comments below or in the comments on the YouTube channel, and I will endeavor to answer them as, as succinctly and as quickly as I can. I want to thank you again for being here. Make sure you like and follow the video, and I will see you on our next episode. Have a great night, everybody, and you too, Fishy Lips. <laughs>